Okay, let's get started. Good morning. Let's see um, any particular questions, topics you would like to raise? I have a couple of things, so um, let's see. Most important one, um, things are going fast. We're moving quite along, so we're already going to have a midterm next week, Friday. Um, so, um, as I told you before, it's going to be an open book exam. means you can bring whatever you want to uh, in terms of background material. Um, it's going to be uh, more kind of under questions about understanding, so don't, no reason or no need to learn equations from ahead and things like that, even though we don't have that many equations. But that doesn't mean that you don't have to study. Uh, I've seen people come up with a whole pile of paper like this and then an exam trying to read really quickly to the material. It doesn't work that way. So um, what we're going to cover in that exam is everything from day one, when we started, basically uh, talking about metrics, how to analyze designs, evolution of designs, and then going to inverters, switch logic, uh, sizing of switch logic, inverter chains, and then complex logic, and to the end of today's lecture, basically. Uh, today we're going to still cover something which is called logical effort. That's going to be included as well. So everything up to the end of today's lecture is going to be included. We will have a review session on Thursday, and I think uh, Wen already sent a kind of doodle poll out to uh, how determine the right timing and things like that, but it's going to be on the evening somewhere on February 16th. Um, and the idea is there to help you, if you have any particular topics you would like to see readdressed, say, that's a topic as I still have some problems with this or this or this issue, uh, can we discuss it again? That's one. We're also going to go to some old exams. Actually, if you go to BSpace, you will see already that there's some old exams posted there. Uh, so you have a chance to kind of look through some of those and see what we're typically looking at. Okay, uh, so that's that. Now, um, as you know, uh, we have uh, lab number two this week, and some of you did it already on Monday, the other one is, is tomorrow. Uh, lab three is a little bit more complicated, um, and I just want to make sure we get it clearly in, in our minds what is, what's going on here. Um, because of the midterm, I don't want to have a lab just before the day before the midterm, so there's going to be no lab next Thursday. But there will be a lab, the first lab, the Monday lab will be held on Monday. No question about that, but there will be no lab on Thursday. The week after, there's no lab on Monday, but there's a Thursday lab. So we basically spread the labs over two weeks. That's, uh, um, so, but keep on sticking to the lab you're normally assigned to, that's important. That's all I have in terms of um, general issues. Uh, is there any particular questions? I think um, once we've gone to midterm one, and once we have lab three behind us, we're going to start thinking project. So that's going to start happening about week. We're week number three right now. It's going to be about week five or something like that. We're going to start thinking about uh, a project and what we're going to do there. Okay. All right, so um, as I said, what we're going to do today is talk a little bit more about complex logic. And then the obvious question, if I can do complex logic, now we ask the same questions as we have done for inverters. How do you size those? How do you do minimize for delay? How do you minimize for energy? What are the trade-off games you can play if you would have a structure that's composed of a number of gates? Right? Same questions. And again, you don't need to understand everything about transistors if you know the switch model, the fact there's capacitances, and where those capacitances come from, you're basically there. You actually can do a lot of reasoning already about logic structure and logic optimization. Okay, so um, this is where we were at at the end of last lecture. Um, if you want to implement um, static logic, and remember static logic, we mean what we mean by that is logic where if you are in a steady state, right, it means nothing is switching around, the, the levels are basically steady, then your output has to be connected to either VDD or ground via low impedance path, low resistance path, which means that somewhere you're going to clamp 
that output either to high or to low. Uh, so in no conditions can the output be floating. That's what we call static logic. And the way you build it is by combining, uh, and if it, the, the most general way of building it is something we call complementary logic. Complementary logic uses the following thing. It's kind of a push-pull type of organization where you have a pull-down network and a pull-up network. The pull-up network implements the ones. The pull-down network implements the zeros of your truth table. That's the way you have to look at it. So you look at your truth table, whatever logic function, you have a bunch of zeros, that, that's your pull-down network, a bunch of ones, your pull-up network. Those two networks should never be on at the same time, with the exception of when you're transitioning. Obviously, when the inputs go from one state to the other state, there's going to be a time, a short time, when both networks are going to be on. But in general, they should never be on at the same time. That's why we call them complementary networks. They're dually, they're dually, dual logic networks, as we call them. And as I really showed in the last lecture, the way you construct it is by you're looking at, let's say, the pull-down network, serious connection of NMOS transistors means AND, parallel connections means R. And uh, remember, this is always inverting because you have a pull-down network. You, uh, the pull-down network basically implements zero. So that's an inverting functionality. Okay, so um, let's uh, have a look at, for instance, this logic gate, how you would construct it. It's uh, just standard logic equation, D plus A and B plus C. So as I mentioned, when you look at the logic function, you start with the inner end. It's a B plus C, that's two transistors, and that's an OR function. That's going to be, if I want to construct that, we're going to have two transistors in parallel. So you're going to have a transistor doing B and one that does C. So that's the first step. Then you have to end it with A. And means serious connection. So you have A. And then there's an OR with D, so you have another parallel connection of this whole structure with the D input. Bingo. So we have a pull-down network. You can see this is D plus A and B plus C. Now to implement the PMOS network, you do you just um, anything which is you kind of create a dual structure, which means that anything which was serious connection in the NMOS network becomes a parallel connection in the PMOS network and the vice versa. Okay? So for instance, B and C, if you look now, D is parallel with A and this whole network. So we're gonna have somewhere a serious connection. So if you start from the top here, so somewhere we're gonna have a PMOS connection with D which is going to be in series with this construction here, with the other part of the logic expression. So we have D in series with another logic network, which would be A, if you look here, we have now a series connection. So that translates into a parallel connection. So somewhere here, we're going to have a transistor connect to A. And B and C were in, in parallel, so they're going to have to be in series here. And that's it. So as you can see, these are perfectly dual networks from each other. And I think it's a good exercise. If you are not sure, what I would just do is look at your truth table and look for every row in the truth table of this logic thing. There's four inputs, so this is going to be uh, two to four, 16 inputs in your truth table, 16 rows in your truth table. You look at, are all my zeros implemented? Are all my ones implemented? Okay? If you don't know a logic function, just construct a truth table and you will see basically what emerges. Okay? So later on, I will explain how you can efficiently implement this. Uh, this is just a circuit diagram. If I want to do a layout of this, obviously, you're going to have to think a little bit. Because where do I do my PMOS? Where do I put my NMOSs? What's the order of my transistors in such a way that I give efficient layout? That's a different story, and we're going to talk about that in a couple of lectures. But that's not the issue for today. Now, what I haven't told you anything about yet is how to size those devices. Right? Um, I have now eight transistors in here. How would I choose the relative sizes of the NMOS and the PMOSs or the various NMOSs? Will I make them all the same size? Or will I make them different sizes? What should I do here? 
That's an important question to think about because it's going to impact, obviously, the performance. Now, um, let's do some preliminary thinking about this. Okay? Assume, again, that I have a capacitance here. And we're going to make life easy. In reality, capacitance are going to be sitting all through this structure, right? There's going to be some capacitance con connected to this internal node. There's going to be connect capacitance here. There will be capacitance here. There will be capacitance at this node in the network. So in reality, the capacitance is going to be somewhat distributed. We're going to make life easy, and we're going to assume that we can bring all the capacitance to the output and consider it as a single load capacitance, like we did before. Uh, make, uh, we're going to go back. We're going to come back to that later and see what the difference is. But let's assume right now that you have a single CL load capacitance, or intrinsic, and that is caused by all those parasitic trans capacitance of the transistors. Now, what's going to determine the propagation delay is obviously the resistance of the pull down network, pull down up network. But there's something you might observe here. If I ask you what is the resistance of this particular, let's say I look at the pull-down network, what would be the resistance be? Do you know? Can you tell me? That's exactly right. So the answer is, indeed, it depends upon the inputs you apply. If, for instance, um, I turn on A, D, B, and C, all my transistors are on, a parallel connection of two resistors as you know, half, if they're equal, they would be halving that resistance. So you reduce the resistance by turning parallel paths on. You put things in series, the resistance goes up, it doubles. So we have to make sure that we um, manage to resist. Now, if you ask me, uh, okay, so, so what we have established here is that the resistance is going to be variable. It's not determined in advance, it depends upon the inputs. Then the question is, from a propagation delay perspective, if my resistive variable, if I want to optimize my propagation delay, what should I look at? What should I concentrate on? Series. Sorry? Series. series connection, that's in the right direction, that's correct, but why would you pick the series connection? They have higher resistance, but I'm trying to lead, lead to, if I look every, so my, what I'm alluding to is that the propagation delay is going to be variable, right, because the resistance is variable. What propagation delay do I care about most? The worst case. The worst case. Indeed, because you have to make sure that under any particular condition, I'm al always meeting my timing constraints. I have to meet my clock frequency. So you have to look at the worst case. So what's the worst case in this particular circumstance. What's the worst case condition, let's say, from a pull-down network? What inputs will cause you the longest possible delay? Just... That's right. Exactly. Either this path or that path. Not both simultaneously, because if I turn B and C on simultaneously, I'm getting a parallel connection and my resistance goes down. Not D, because that's a single transistor, <coughs> but it's A and B in series, or A and C in series. That's going to be the worst case. Now, if I want to get a delay which is approximately equal to an inverter, what should I do? Well, I'm going to try to focus on that worst case path and make sure that I size the transistors in such a way that I get a delay or resistance which is equal to an inverter. Remember, if I assume that the resistance of a minimum sized NMOS device would, for an inverter would be one. Then um, what I should do is double the sizes of transistor in series, if they're, if they're on the critical path. So I make this transistor two times wider, and this transistor two times wider, then the series resistance is going to be one, right? Because, you, you put, uh, because now we have a resistance of half, half, you add them up together, you basically get a resistance of one. So I'm going to make this one two as well, because it's a parallel path. But either A and B or A and C are my worst case path. D I don't care about, because if D only is on, if only D is on, we just have the resistance equal to a single in, uh, transistor, so we keep this equal to one. So what I did is 
I double the sizes of transistors which are in series connection, or I, if I have more transistors in series, I would make them even larger than that. And if they're in parallel connections, I just leave them the same. So let's do the same thing for our uh, PMOS network. What would be the worst case there? C, B, and D, correct. You have three PMOS devices in, in series right there. So there's a couple of ways of sizing this, but I'm going to do it very simple. I'm going to use the same rule. If they are in series, I'm going to double. If I'm in parallel, I'm not doing anything. But remember, PMOS devices start already with a size of two to start with because of the mobility factor. So your PMOS device is always going to be double the size of your NMOS. So we're going to have two devices in series here. This D is in series with the network. So we're going to make this double the size because it's two networks in series, parallel, the series connection. So two times two, I'm going to make this four. This I make four. What should be the size of B and C then? Eight, indeed. And now you can see that under any condition, if I look at the worst case, my resistor is going to be equal to that of a minimum size inverter, one. Okay? So that's the way you go along sizing those devices. But as you see now that you already start noticing something that you should be aware of. Remember when we sized inverters? We really were talking, thinking a lot about uh, well, it's nice to size them up, but it has a side effect. And the side effect was what? Larger input. Larger input capacitance. Now you can see what's already happening here. If you have all those transistors in series and parallel, or mostly in series, we make them bigger, we keep the resistance within check, but we're going to create load at the previous stages. You already start seeing that complex logic by nature is going to be slower than a simple inverter. The more fan in I get, the slower my gate will become. That's a necessity. Okay? So that's kind of getting some background on sizing. We'll come back to that, but that gives you an idea of really what's going on here. So to wrap up everything we discussed last lecture, uh, CMOS properties, what holds for an inverter holds for a complex gate, full rail-to-rail -rail swing. If you size them correctly, we have a symmetrical VTC. Again, the VM should be somewhere in the middle. Uh, propagation delay is a function of load capacity and resistance, no static power dissipation, and direct power during switching. Okay. So, you already saw that it's non-trivial to talk about delay of a complex gate. And, and, and sizing is not going to be trivial. Now, if I, I showed you already what you can do with a simple gate, but now if you put a whole bunch of the gates in, se in sequence, if you have a complex network, how are you going to size your transistors? How are you basically going to determine um, what structure to choose? And i give you one example here. I, I show you three times, three implementations of exactly the same function. This is, uh, if you look at it, this is an eight input AND gate, right? You have an AND gate followed by an inverter, there's an eight input AND gate, AND gate. Now I can implement an eight input gate in three different ways, or many, or, uh, no, actually, there's more than that. But um, I could actually use two stages where I have, first of all, four input NAND gates followed by two input NOR gate. Or I can use only two input gates. In that case, I need four stages. It's an, remember, it's a inver non-inverting structure. It's an AND. So I'm going to have at least two stages. Remember that CMOS logic is non-inverting. It's inverting, sorry. So which one is best? Anybody who dares to venture, what, uh, which structure I should choose among those three? Who votes? For, let's, let's label them. This one, two, and three. Which one would be the pr preferred structure? One, two, or three? Who votes for one? One, vote for one. Who votes for two? Okay, okay. And who votes for three? Okay, so it's an even kind of some distribution. And the answer, you're, you're somewhere right, because I don't know the answer either. <laughs> it really depends. It depends upon a couple of factors. Number one, obviously, best for what? Well, propagation delay would be the primary course, right? But what I don't know is, 
how much load capacity do I have? If I don't tell you in advance what load capacity it is, it actually might change. If there's a very small load versus a large load, I might actually choose a different structure. Or there might be a different optimal structure. If I look at energy versus performance, you might again choose for different structures. Uh, the optimum might be this structure, if I think about energy. Actually, from a performance perspective, this might be best or something else might be best. So the question is, how do we answer this? And again, we're going to try to create a framework where I can analytically think about this, where I don't have to basically guess or simulate, but try to do some simple analysis to say, what is the structure that's going to be the best one for me? By the way, this thing here, this 8 input AND gate, uh, it's an AND gate, but we also very often call it a decoder. Why do we call it a decoder? Well, if you have a memory, memory structure, large memory, you apply an address lines to that memory. Uh, those address lines are going to be binary encoded, right, the number. So I want to get word number 17. 17, that's going to require 5 bits. Now, the decoder is going to translate this into a completely expanded form where only one out of the end, two to the end line is going to be high. And that's implemented using AND gates. It says, uh, my address is going to be A, B, C, D bar, E, or something like that. That's an AND gate that you're trying to implement. So that's why we call it decoders. Again, we're going to talk more about decoders later on. So question one. Um, let's see here. So. Um, as I, I just showed you, uh, it's, it's not going to be obvious in advance what's going to be the optimal structure. And, 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 and let me give you an idea a little bit. Um, the reason why I'm not sure which is going to be working better here is that um, what we're going to prove, and you already kind of got a glimpse of this, is that inverters are darn good at driving capacitances, better than complex gates. If I have a large capacitance, and I try to do this with one large complex gate, that's not going to be very effective because you have that sequence of transistors, that series connection of transistors, trying to drive a large capacitance with a larger resistance is going to be hard. So driving large capacitance is best done by inverters, simple gates. If you have small capacitance, then you might be better off with a complex gate. So there's some trade-off games to be played here. So that's already pointing to the next question here. Same, same question. I have two structures. And I ask, which one is better? Well, in this case, I'm telling you we're going to have large capacitance. Now, I gave you some of the answer already. Um, it's kind of, again, counterintuitive. But from a propagation delay perspective, this structure will be faster than the first one. Because now, what I'm doing is saying, well, I have a complex gate here. Complex gates are not very good at driving capacitance. We're going to optimize the complex gate on its own, make sure it's fast, and then carefully size those inverters in such a way that we do the best possible job of driving the big capacitor. Okay? So it's a divide and conquer strategy again. Let the gates work together. So it is definitely counterintuitive. If you look at those two pictures, this cannot be faster than this one. There's more stuff. But indeed it is. Definitely if I have to keep the input capacitance into mind. Okay? So, what we're going to do is um, trying to introduce a method that answers both of those questions. The ones I showed you. I should be able, in the end of the day, if I give you the load capacity, you should be able to tell me what structure is better and how to size it. And as I mentioned, this is going to be an extension of the buffer sizing problem. We, we learn about the buffer sizing, you have an inverter chain, what you do is divide the load over all the different elements, and then we choose a number of stages equal to four or approximately so that we have the optimal final structure. Okay? Now, in order to do so, we're going to have to do some work. Uh, this is what we did for buffer sizing. We said uh, a couple of things. We said that we're going to make each stage do the same amount of effort. Uh, are we divided to capacity fan out over all stages? And that's done by making sure that the capacitance at any node is the geometric means between the load capacitor of the previous state and the next stage. And the, the typical fan out, optimal fan out, will be around four. Okay? So now, 
I already talked about complex gate sizing, so I don't think I have to repeat that. I did already with the example. Remember what we did? So when you do a complex gate, we're going to size it in such a way we look at the worst case path, and we're going to make sure that we size it in such a way that we get a resistance which is equivalent to what was basically the case for a single inverter. Okay, so let's look a little bit at the two input NAND gate. Just to give you an idea of what the propagation delay of a NAND gate could look like. Okay, here's our NAND gate. Two NMOS transistors in series, two PMOS transistors in parallel. From a sizing perspective, we use a rule we already defined. In the pull down network, two transistors in series. So what we do, we double the sizes. So we make those two sizes two. PMOS devices to transition parallel, we keep them at the same size, which was already two. So all your transition in this case will be W over L of two. Okay? Now, what does that do from an overall capacitance perspective? So we have size to resistors. Let's look at capacitances a bit. Um, I'm going to look particularly at the output node. Let's assume that intermediate nodes don't have any capacitance. That's very small. Okay, let's assume that for the time being. So I look at the output node, the drain capacitance at node out is going to be what? It's going to be the sum of the drain capacitance of transistor A and the drain capacitors of the PMOS devices A and B. They're double in size, so we assume that the drain capacitance is going to get doubled as well. So my total capacitance is going to be 2 plus 2 plus 2 is 6 times the drain capacitance of a minimum size device. Is that clear? So I have a drain capacitance here, which is equal to 6 times CD. Now, what is our gate capacitance? Looking into the gate, we see that, um, let's look at input A. It's going to be, it might be variable from gate to gate, obviously, uh, from input to input. So you look at input A, what I see is two transistors with size 2, right, a PMOS and an NMOS device. So my total incapacitance is going to be equal to 4 times the minimum gate capacitance, CG. Now, if you compare that to an inverter, remember the inverter? What's the input capacitance of an inverter, approximately, in terms of uh, CG, minimum size inverter? Three. Three, right? Three. So we see actually what's happening. We make our resistance the same. But now my gate capacitance is going to be a little bit larger than what you have for an inverter. It's actually four thirds, because now we have four inverters, three divided by two by each other, you get four thirds. Okay. So what does that mean from a delay perspective? You can already imagine now that it's going to have some impact on your overall delay equation. So let's work it out a bit. So the delay of my NAND gate would be equal to KR. K is some constant, R is my resistance, C internal plus CL. You can basically put this as a function of W, that's the R min divided by W, and the CD will be multiplied with, with, uh, with the W factor, the size of the device. Now, what I'm going to do is divide this by the input capacity of my NAND gate. Okay, it brings uh, the input capacity of the NAND gate outside. So I divide this and I divide this factor. Same equation, but I just bring CG NAND, the input gate capacitance, to the input. And um, I'm getting here the ratio of CD NAND over CG NAND. Okay, what's my CD NAND? 6 times CD. CG NAND is 4 times CG. But we know that CG and CD are related with a certain factor which is equal to gamma. So always a constant ratio between the two. So with a factor here, we're going to get 6 CD over 4 CG is 6 4 is actually gamma times 3 halves. And then you have here CL divided by your input capacitance, basically your fanon. Now I can restructure this a little bit, bring this all into the inverter delay, the minimum inverter, which is a CG inverter times R min. You divide this out and I get the following expression. Kind of interesting. There's two factors in here, like always. Uh, remember, a delay always have an intrinsic delay and an extrinsic delay. Let's look at the intrinsic delay. What we notice here is that 
compared to an inverter, which has T invert times gamma, right? That's the equation for an inverter. We always T invert gamma plus F, right? That was the equation we had for the inverter. Here we see that uh, intrinsic delay is actually doubled by a factor of two approximately. Where does that come from? Well, it's the fact that if whatever you do with the sizing, this is a more complex structure, it always will be slower. Even if you have no load capacity, intrinsic delay of a NAND gate is slower than an inverter. And it's by a factor of two. Actually, it turns out that most of the time it's going to be equal to the fan in. So if you take a three input gate, it might be three times gamma. Four inputs gate will be four times gamma. So my intrinsic delay goes up. That's one factor. The second one we observe is very important as well. And it's purely a result of this capacitive ratio here. You get more input capacitors in complex structures. We get basically a factor F, as we expected. The delay should be proportional to the fan out. The more capacitors I load the device with, the more delay I get. But there's another factor in here, that factor 4 third, which is popped up right here. For the same resistance, I'm getting a capacitance, incapacitance, which is a little bit higher, 4 third actually. What it says is that this gate will have a harder time driving capacitance. Instead of uh, having a delay which is equal to F, proportional to F, it's going to be four, turns at times, four thirds times F. So this already shows you that complex gates have a harder dri time driving capacitance fast. So that's uh, an example. It's, um, but it's a fairly generic result because if we do the same thing now, and we look at a two-put NOR gate, and the same deal. Um, now, if I size the devices, it's going to be slightly different. The end MOSFETs are in series, in parallel, so we keep them the same size. So they're both minimum-sized trap of transistors. The P MOSFETs are in, are, are in series, so they have to get doubled up. So we make them four. Now, if you look at the input capacity of this structure, uh, for the same resistor, what you see here is that my input capacitance, load capacity is the same. This uh, 1 plus 1 plus 4 is 6 intrinsic load capacitance. Input, if I look at input A, I see capacity which is equal to 5 times CG. Or overall, compared to an inverter, it's not 4 thirds, but it's 5 thirds. Which shows that uh, a NOR gate will have a harder time than an AND gate driving a capacitance fast. Um, again, that's uh, not a surprise, because here we, um, the difference between the two is as follows. In the NAND gate, we're putting, if you look at the series connection, we're putting NMOS transistor in series. In the NOR gate, we put PMOS transistor in series. The PMOSs are already bad. If you put them in series, you can make it even worse. So that already says that if I look at complementary CMOS logic, if I want to make something fast, I'd rather use NAND gates than NOR gates. NOR gates are not very good because of this serious connection of PMOS devices. But the bottom line, however, is that the 5-3 factor pops up. If I go to the same analysis of the delay, I'm getting this expression. It says now that my delay is going to be equal to 2 times gamma, intrinsic delay, same as for the NOR gate. As I said, the, that intrinsic delay is primarily a function of your fan in of the gate. And we have another factor here which says that, which is now 5 thirds of F, which it really shows, again, that it's harder to drive capacitance with a NOR gate than a NAND gate. But remember, there's a multiplier factor here now. So how do you generalize this? Well, I'm, I'm seeing that for the inverter, we have an equation which says T invert gamma plus F. That was our equation. We're going to add a couple of extra parameters in here, two parameters. This, this one here and this one here. These are the two extra parameters we're going to have in our equation. Okay, let's do that. There we go. This is what we call a, the generalized expression for propagation delay of any possible gate. So two parameters we added. P. P we call the intrinsic delay. It is something, it's an intrinsic delay factor and it's a pure function of the delay of the structure of the gate, the fan in of the gate. So it's not impacted at all by the sizing. 
It's something if I look at a given technology, I look at my gate structure, I can determine P, we're done. Okay? And as I said, typically it will be equal to the fan in approximately. The other one is this multiplier factor of F. And this we give the name of logical effort. Kind of what it says is if you have more logic into a certain function, driving your passage is going to get harder. So it is a measure of the complexity of the gate, LE. And I'll come back to that later. But it says, how hard is it for that particular logic structure to drive a load capacitance? That's really what LE does, compared to an inverter. So an inverter is the standard benchmark. How much worse is it than an inverter? Okay? So that's why we get this full equation here. And for obviously for an inverter, life is easy. P is equal to 1, and LE is going to be equal to 1. But for any other logic gate, it's going to be a higher number. Okay. So, if you want to make life a little bit easier, uh, typically, we're going to drop the T invert. That's a constant multiplier and everything. So, we can talk about the unit delay is going to be T invert. And then our delay of a gate is just going to be this P times gamma. And assume this is for gamma equal to 1 is going to be equal to EF times P, where EF is now the product of the fan-out. And we call this now the electrical fan-out. We don't call it simply fan-out anymore. Electrical fan-out is the ratio of my load capacitance versus my gate capacitance, input gate capacitance, like we had before. No change. But it's electrical fan-out. You have load transformation and impedances. Load capacitance, input capacitance. We multiply this with a logical effort, which is a function of the gate that tries to drive this capacitance. And the combination of the two we call the effective fan-out. Just naming, right? It doesn't matter really what you call it, but it's kind of a good thing to know. So the fan, effective fan-out is the product of the logical effort times the electrical fan-out. Okay? And remember, logical effort is purely a function of topology. So the question is then, how do I know what logical effort is and how can we determine it? Right, that's a logical question we ask ourselves. So here's my definition of logical effort. So remember number one, we assume that the inverter has the smallest logical effort. It's a very simple logical function, so it's very straightforward. It has the smallest logical effort. It also has the smallest intrinsic delay. So the logical effort of a gate is defined as the following thing. It's really, if you look at your time constant of your gate, time the time constant of an inverter, how do they compare to each other? That's really what logical effort is. Now, how can you easily define that? Well, assume that I size my gate in such a way that my resistance of my gate is equal to the resistance of the inverter. That's what we did so far, right? You take your inverter, you size it, minimum one and two, you take your logical gate, you size it in such a way that the worst case delay is going to be equal in terms of resistance. And then you take just the ratio of the capacitances. Uh, the capacitance of my inverter versus the capacitance of my complex gates, looking at the input, and the ratio of those is my logical effort. So I'm basically setting R is equal to 1, and you get just the ratio of the input capacitances. That's your logical effort. I go to the opposite. I could size them, they have the same input capacitance, and I compare the resistances. Same deal. I, that's the easiest way for us to define logical effort. And I'll show you, um, uh, I'll show it to you with a number of examples. Um, so you how to compute logical effort. Because it's important. We're gonna give, we're gonna compute logical effort very regularly. It's a very important property of a gate. And later on, we're gonna start talking about different logic families. Not complementary CMOS anymore, but we might talk about dynamic logic or pass transistor logic and all those type of things. And the way we're going to compare them says, what's the logical effort? Compute me the logical effort, and then you can compare apples and apples. Is it better or is it worse? How much is it better? Right. So that's the trick. Make the resistances equal, look at the input capacitance, or make the input capacitance equal, look at the ratio of the resistances compared to an inverter. And as you already know, logical effort increase with gate complexity. So let's look at some 
um, I already gave you the answers at the bottom here. You know already some uh, because we already did it. But look at the inverter. Obviously, my logical effort of an inverter is going to be equal to 1 because you compare it to an inverter. That's 1. NAND gate, you size them in such a way that the minimum resist that the resistances are the same as the inverter. So serious connection, you double devices, parallel connection, keep them equal. You look at the input capacitor, I see an input capacitance of 4. For both A and B, it's symmetrical. The same deal. So 4 is the input capacitor of the NAND gate. Inverter has 3, 4 terms. So it's 4 terms times worse than your um, 2 input NAND gate would be. Let's look at this structure here, the NOR gate. We double the PMOS devices, input capacitor becomes 5, logical effort is 5 thirds. Okay, that's easy, we didn't, we've done those. Let's do something a little bit more complicated. But uh, just kind of give you an idea of the impact this has on delay. Remember, the quality of a gate will determine how fast it can drive a capacitance. Professor, how, I, yes? I'm sorry, I have to pause. Um, the number is 5 and 3, where did those come from in the last slide? Okay, sorry, let me go back. <coughs> so, number 4. So look at input A, let's say. What's the, I have sized the transistors. What's looking at the input capacitor? What I see is I have a PMOS device and an NMOS device. You double the total in capacity is 4. I, I doubled both of the size compared to, let's say, a minimum size type of gate. So this total capacitance I see is 4 times CG. Because I get 2 for the NMOS, 2 for the PMOS. And, and if you double the size of the device, it basically doubles the capacitance, gate capacitance that I'm seeing. So that's where I get my 4. The same is true for B. 3 is what I see here. And if I look into the input of my inverter, I see 2 plus 1 is 3. That's my total gate capacitance I'm seeing. So this device has a gate capacitance at input A and B, which is 4 terms, four thirds times larger than what you would see for an inverter. <coughs> if the resistors are the same, I've sized the device in such a way that the resistance in the pull-down network and the pull-down network is the same. Same here. If I look at input A, what I see is 1 plus 4 is 5. The inverter is 3, so I get a factor of 5 third. Okay? So that's what you really do. You look at any possible input and you determine the value. Now, I think it's important to kind of realize what the impact is of this equation that I showed you. So this is my, uh, I'm going to now plot delay, normalized delay in function of TP invert, let's say, as a function of fan out F. When F is equal to 0, which means I'm not driving anything. I'm just driving my intrinsic capacitances. For inverter, my delay will be equal to gamma. Right? That's the only factor that's left. I get gamma. For my NAND gate, I will get 2 gamma. So the intrinsic delay of my NAND gate, for if I even if I'm not driving anything, is going to be 2 times slower already. It's going to be 2, ga two gamma. But now, the logical effort, what the logical effort is basically determined, we know that our propagation delay, if I start increasing f, is going to be linear with f. But the slope of that curve is going to be depending upon the Le. If an inverter Le is equal to 1, p is equal to 1, so my delay is going to be equal to 1 plus f, right? For the NAND gate, logical effort is going to be equal to 4 thirds and P is equal to 2. So my equation is going to be 2 plus 4 thirds times F. And that's why you can see here, you get also linear dependency, but rather than being proportional to F, it's proportional to 4 terms times F. So if I increase fan out, my delay will increase faster than what you get for normal inversion. So that's really what logical effort does. It manipulates the slope of your fan out factor. And the larger LE, the steeper that slope will become, and the harder it will become to drive a large fan out. So this is the same thing that I just showed you. Okay, let's do something a little bit more complex. Um, I've showed you already a, a NAND and a NOR gate. Let's think about an XOR gate. What would the logical effort be of an XOR gate? Let's first figure out how to do an XOR. XOR is equal to F is equal to A 
B bar plus A bar B. Right? It's your typical XOR function. So how do you implement this? Well, it's kind of a nasty function. Uh, XOR is one of the worst functions to implement in complementary CMOS. Remember, complementary CMOS always has to be non-inverting. If you have a single stage, it's a, a single stage will always be inverting. There's an implicit inversion. So we're going to need actually inputs and input inverse in this particular case. It's going to make it a little bit more tricky. But if I look at the logic implementation, um, what it means is actually the pull-down network is going to be an XNOR function because it's inverting. So XNOR, oh sorry, there's no PMOS here. There we go. You have an NMOS, NMOS. So this is going to be A and B in parallel. Oops. I'm kind of insisting on these PMOSes here. There we go. And that's A bar, B bar. That's my NMOS function. Why is that? Well, if you just look at it, it's A, B plus A bar, B bar, invert. If you look at this, you analyze this, it ultimately equals A, B bar plus A bar B. We just do some logic manipulation on this. So two NMOS in series, two PMOS in series. Uh, two, two NMOS in series in one network. The other one is also two NMOSs. But remember, these are inverted inputs. And the same thing is true in the other case. Series connection of transistor becomes parallel connection in the pull-up network. So I'm going to have here two PMOSs in, in parallel. And this is A and B. And I get another two PMOSs in parallel. That's A bar, B bar. Okay? So that's my um, XOR function. But remember, it's actually not complete because I assume that I have A bar and B bar available. If I really want to implement the full XOR gate, I would have to also determine, add some inverters at the input so that A becomes A bar and B becomes B bar. So I need two more inverters to really implement the complete function. But let's assume that I don't for the time being. So let's figure out how to do the sizing. Well, the sizing is actually not that complex. Um, series connection of NMOS devices is what? You double the devices. So it's going to be 2, 2, 2, 2. All the same. We all double them because we have two devices in series. PMOSes, same story. In the worst case, I have two PMOS in series, so this is going to be 4, 4, 4, 4. Okay? Clear? All right. So now what's the logical effort? What I've done so far is size the transistors in such a way that my resistance is, in the worst case, is going to be equal to 1, like an inverter. Um, yes. Uh, so the way you get to two, if you say, I take input A, let's say, I take one, one of any one, you have four inputs, A, B, A bar, B bar. I take input A, and I'm going to look and see, I get two plus four, I get six. Six divided by three becomes two. So for any input here, I have a logical effort which is equal to two. Uh, which is the highest compared to, let's say, your AND and NOR function, NAND and NOR function, which was four thirds and five thirds. But you see the trick? You size the gate and then you just look at your input capacitors and you're done. You have your logical effort. Let's do another one, just for the fun of it. Let me erase this. Uh, let's do a multiplexer. Um, anybody familiar with a multiplexer, what it does? So it's quite straightforward. It's a multiplexer is a function that allows you to use a single control signal, which I call C, to select between two inputs, A or B. So you have, this is the symbol typically for a multiplexer. You have one control signal, C, you have A, B, and F. And the logic function is as follows. So when C is high, I might select A. So... A, 
C plus B C bar. So when C is high, the output is going to be equal to A. When C is low, I'm selecting B. So this is kind of a router. You have a couple of inputs, and you select out of the inputs which one you're going to see at the output using a control signal. If you have only two inputs, you have only one control signal. If you have four inputs, you need two. Right? You have to select between four possible values. That's a multiplexer, very important element. You can see it over and over again, we use this a lot. Again, how do you implement this? Well, it's quite a straightforward. You have, um, I'm not gonna talk about ordering of transistors yet. So if I look at the overall function, and I'm gonna just do the inverted version here. I'm just gonna do F bar, just to make life a little bit easier. You can do the other one too, but it is not. It doesn't make that much of a difference. I'm going to put C here, C bar, A, B. And then the uh, other network is just going to be the inverse parallel connection. Parallel connection, BMOS, 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 BMOS. And this is going to be A, C, B, C bar. Okay? Again, how do you size it? Exactly the same way. Same deal. This is going to be 2, 2, 2, 2, 4, 4, 4, 4. So for A and B, I'm going to see the same thing. C and C bar are a little bit more complex, but then again, you get the same logic expression, basically 6 over 3. You get 2 as logical effort. Okay? So that's just a couple of examples of how to compute this thing. And here's some, ex here's some expression. Now, you can now do this for imp two inputs, three inputs, n inputs. Let's say if you look at the NAND gate, you get n plus 2 over 3, where n is the input. NOR gate, you can see 2 n plus 1 over 3. So this really clearly shows you that NAND gates are preferable than NOR gates when you have CMOS logic. The multiplexer and the XORs are a little bit more complex here. What they actually did is combined, if you have A and A bar, they call this a bundle. You say if you have always single and single invert, I'm gonna bundle them together and take the capacitors of those two together. That's why you get those numbers that I show here. Um, it, I, it, it's a metric, but it's not something that I would recommend I, um, because it's not very clear what that really means. Okay, now, so you have my equation. Remember, delay is now equal to P times gamma plus Le times F. That's my delay equation. So I can now start using this to do the same thing as we did before. Suppose, the same question, suppose I have n gates in sequence. Number one is, how do I size those gates? And number two, how many stages should I have? But remember that it's always possible, if let's say I have a logic function, it's always possible for me to invert some extra, uh, add extra inversions. You have, put two, you have a path, you have two inversions, I don't change the logic function whatsoever. So it is le legit for me to add extra inverters if it doesn't change the functionality. Uh, so we can have some freedom in changing the number of stages. That's really the question we're asking ourselves. Um, one more thing that I think we have to get clear about, because it, it might become a little bit more uh, complicated later on. This is, what does a gate size of 2 mean? So sometimes you'll say, this is say, a gate that has size 4 or size 3. What does that mean? Well, for inverters, it's kind of trivial because it's um, a gate size of 2 means that my input capacity is doubled for the same resistance or that my resistance is halved for the same capacitance. Right? For a gate, there's actually a couple of different options. If I say double, um, it might be either be double the gate capacitance or it might be half the resistance. And they don't go together. They don't, one doesn't mean the other one. Inverter, it always means if you have one, you have basically the other one is the case. So if I basically, this is going to be very clear. I'm going to keep on doing, if I say this is a gate of size X, what I mean by that is that it's a gate capacitance is X times larger than an inverter. That's just a definition. Um, but I think we have to make sure that we are clear about this. If I talk about gate X, it says this is a gate, if you took a, 
your total capacitor looking into it is going to be x times larger than your uh, inverter type structure, a unit inverter. Okay? So that's important because we, we're going to use that quite a bit in the next equation. There's another thing that we haven't talked about, and it's something that you have to be aware of. Um, if I do, so far we looked at inverter chains. And they were kind of fun and easy to handle, uh, but kind of boring because it doesn't do anything. It just drives capacitance. Now I can say, okay, I'm going to make this a little bit more complex. I'm going to make this logic gates. I might have a NAND gate, a NOR gate, and so on and so forth. Right? I could have a chain of complex gates. In reality, when you do logic functionality, there's another thing that's going to happen. Uh, we're not just going to do serious connection, but occasionally you might branch out. Right? You have one gate driving a number of gates. Fan out, really. Okay? That's important, but it's also going to change our equations a bit. Because now this gate is not only driving towards this path, trying to minimize the delay along this path, but there's some other paths as well that come into the game. So this gate will be loaded by inverter A and inverter B. So the branching factor, how much branching you have, is going to be part of our optimization as well. So what do you find as a branching factor at this node X here? This note A here, the branching factor here is going to be, I'm trying to optimize a certain path. I'm looking at the total capacitance on this path here that you have. Divided, and I'm, I'm, I'm taking the, load capacity, the total load capacity of this node, which is, see, suppose I'm looking at this path here. I'm trying to optimize this delay path. But the branching factor on this node is the capacitance that I see on the path divided, or I, I, um, no, let me return it. I'm looking at the total load capacity of this node, which is the capacitance on the path and the capacitance of the path, divided by the capacitance on the path. Is that clear? So what I have here is I'm branching out in two directions, or I might have even more. I might have four, let's say here. I have a whole bunch of them. This is the part I'm trying to optimize. That's why I'm, I'm trying to minimize and delay. So the capacitance that's on the path is the capacitance basically contributed by this inverter only. Right? But in reality, the total capacitance this node has to drive is not only that one, but also one, two, three, three other gates. So the total capacitance I see here is going to be four times an inverter. The only capacitance on the path itself of interest is going to be one. So my branching factor in this case is going to be four. I'm Having, I have to drive four times more capacitance than the capacitor on the pod itself. Okay? That's going to be important because it's going to help us play around a little bit with equations and, and how much every effort, when we talk about effort, a single stage has to do. So this thing has to work harder because this thing is kind of straightforward. It's just inverted in sequence. This gate has to work not only to drive this pod, but also all the other pods as well. So it has to do some extra effort to do so. Okay. All right. So here's how we're going to basically play the game. So we have a logic network, and you have a set of input or a set of inputs. You have a, a, a set of outputs, but I'm going to look at one path. I'm going to try to minimize the delay between one input and one output. Okay, that's my goal. Uh, the delay along that path is easily defined. We just use our logical effort equation. It says that our delay is going to be the sum of all the delays of all the gates on the path, as before. Remember the additive property of propagation delay. So my delay is going to be the sum over all gates, which is n, times the intrinsic delay of every gate, plus the logical effort of that gate and the fan out of that particular gate, f, ratio of input and output capacitance. Okay, so that's our delay. Nothing has changed, same equation as before, just a little bit more complex. Uh, we're going to define some extra definitions. The fan, effective fan out, remember the effective fan out of a particular stage is going to be the product of the logical effort of that stage times fi. So this is the effective fan out. The electrical fan out, remember the electrical fan out is the ratio between the input capacitance and the output capacitance. Now, if I do this logic block, somewhere I have an input, 
somewhere I have to drive at the output a large capacitance CL. And you have a path between the two. We'll define as the path electrical effort, or the uh, electrical fan out, is going to be equal to this output capacitance divided by the input capacitance, like before. It's your capital F, some output capacitance I'm trying to drive, some input capacitance C coming into my structure. Right? This doesn't take into account logical effort. It's just the ratio between capacitances. Um, some other things. So we have the total electrical fan out. We can also, on that path, define the total logical effort. The total logical effort is going to be the project, product of logical effort of stage 1, stage 2, stage 3, stage 4. It gives you a sign of the amount of complexity of logic I'm trying to do along that path. It will be all inverters, it will be 1. But if you start putting NAND gates in there, NOR gates, obviously it's going to be higher. So you have the path electrical fan out, path logical effort. The branching effort of that path is going to be the product of all the branching factors. If again, if you have just a chain, branching effort is going to be equal to 1. However, if I keep branching around, I'm going to have a larger factor B here. Now, that's all well and done. But if you look at my delay equation, my delay equation is going to say that I'm going to have the sum of the total delay is going to be determined of the sum of all the path, uh, uh, the effective fan outs of every possible gate. So actually, if you come to it, what we'll see is that path delay is going to be, as we said, this is intrinsic delay that's fixed. There's nothing I can do about this because that's only determined by the nature of the logic. So it's really by determined by the sum of the electrical fan outs, effective fan outs of every stage. Now we define the path effort, that's the first thing we're going to compute. Path effort is really going to look at what we're going to try to do in a path. You have an electrical fan out F, input output capacitance. I have a number of logical efforts along that path, and I have a number of branching factors along this path. So the path effort is combining all those things together. Capital F times the sum of the LE, or the product of the LEs, times the product of the Bs. Now, if I want to minimize delay, what we're going to do is the following things that we discussed before, right? If you try to, to look at this and say, well, you minimize the delay, you're going to take the uh, partial derivative to every particular intermediate capacitance. That's what you do. Intermediate capacitance will determine your size. But the bottom line is what you come up with is exactly the same answer as before. What's going to minimize your delay is very simple. It is the factor that's going to take, make sure that every stage does the same amount of effort, or that your delay is equally divided over all the stages in your network. So I take my total delay, shown here. To minimize that, we're going to make every stage do exactly the same amount of work. Now, some stages have it easier to do work than other ones. Like, for instance, if I have an inverter, it's easier to drive a large capacitance. If I have a complex gate, the capacitance I'm going to drive is going to be limited. But in the end, every effort, every single stage along the path has to do the same amount of work. What it boils down to is my path effort is a factor. That's my total effort I'm trying to do. What we're saying is that every stage has to do the same amount of work. What we say is that the effective fan out of every stage should be equal to the same number. Effective fan out is what I can do. That right? is a product of that electrical fan out of that stage times the logical effort. If you make every stage having the same effective fan out, we're going to minimize the delay. Okay? So the product PE, the path effort, is going to be EF to the power N. Okay? We make all of them exactly the same. And the optimal value that we're looking for is EF. So what's the effective fan out of every gate? Well, it's the nth root, if you have n stages, of the total path effort. Okay? So, and the effective fan outs. As we know, these are LE times F1, LE, LE2, that's, that's stage 1, stage 2, stage N. You see we make all those factors the same. Before, we only made the electrical fan the same. Now we make actually the product of the logical effort and the electrical fan the same. Okay? And in that case, then, your overall minimum path delay is nicely defined. It's going to be just N times, oops, close, N times this factor plus a intrinsic delay. 
Is that kind of clear? So what you do is the following thing. So look at it from a procedural perspective. I want to optimize a large complex of lo chunk of logic. I know what my load capacitance is. Somewhere I have the driver capacitance and now my input capacitance. So we can compute that quite easily. That's my electrical fan out of the path. So load capacitance, input capacitance. I can look at the path and define the logical effort along that path. It's a product of all the logical efforts. I look along the path, uh, so, so what I then have do is, is, let's forget about branching factor for a second. Let's assume no branching, right? So capital F times the product of the LEs is gonna be my path effort, okay? I mean, these are two things we easily can compute because the LEs are just a function of the logic gates we have along the path. We find that, we know how many stages we have, we find basically effective fan out per stage. And from there on, then we can determine what the electrical fan out per stage should be, and that allows us to size the gates and figure out how to put the relative sizing together. To best to see this, let, let's do a little example here. And let's forget about the optimal number of stages for a second here. If this thing wants to go, there we go. Here's a simple example. Let's just do that. Right, I'm having a structure. It's an inverter, NAND gate, NOR gate, and an inverter again, and a capacitance. And the capacitance is five, which means it's five times the minimum gate capacitance. The gate capacitance of this inverter here. So my input capacitance here is one. So what is capital F? In this particular case is how much? That's my total pot electrical fan out. Is gonna be how much? Five, right? how much ratio between output capacitance, load capacitance, and input capacitance. That's five. Now for each gate along the path, I can compute the logical effort, or I know the logical effort. This is a inverter. Logical effort is equal to one. Okay? The, this is a three input NAND gate. Logical effort is how much? Five thirds. Remember, NAND gate is four thirds, but if you start, it's, if you make N larger, it goes gradually up. So five thirds for this NAND gate. NOR gate, we know that, two input NOR gate, logical effort is five thirds. And the last inverter, logical effort is one. So along this path, what is what we call the path logical effort, or the product of the logical effort is how much? Well, it's gonna be one times five thirds, times five thirds, times one, that's 25 over nine. That's how much effort I have to do from a pure logical perspective along that path. So what is our path effort now? Well, the path effort is a product of the total electrical F fan out we're having, capital F, times the logical effort of all of my stages. So it's gonna be 25 over nine times five is 125 times nine. Okay? So let's give you a sign how hard this path has to work. Now we're gonna say, we're gonna basically define, or to optimize this structure, we're gonna divide equally the load over all stages. How many stages do we have here? Four, right? Four stages, two inverters, NAND gate, NOR gate. So per stage, I'm gonna take the nth root out of this number. So I'm gonna do 125 over nine times one quarter, take the one quarter of that um, uh, root, the fourth root out of 20, 125 over nine. I don't know what that is. There's a number that goes with it that you can easily compute it. But now what we have determined is the effective fan out per stage. And we say they all have to be the same. In this way, the delay is gonna be equally divided over all stages. Every stage will have exactly the same delay. Now what I haven't determined yet is the sizes. I have to determine now the sizes of each of those gates. Remember the size? Uh, my definition is size, the si gate is size two. If it's input capacity, it's two times larger than minimum size inverter, right? So let's, um, this one is given. Let's clear this out a bit. So this is 125 over nine times one quarter. Um, this one is given, that's a minimum size inverter because we know that the capacitance here has to be equal to one. 
Here we're going to call the size A, this is size B, this is size C. This is what we don't know yet. How do I size those gates in such a way that I minimize delay? Well, I know this number, and I think it is, let me just check here, I have it somewhere here. It's 1.93. A little bit easier. 1.93 is a number. So every stage will basically provide a factor, an effective fan out of 1.93. Now I have to define what that means from a gate perspective. So the fan out, let's start from the end here. The last gate. It has a, um, we know that the, the LE times F is really 1.93. And that's going to be equal to, LE is equal to 1. The effective fan out, the electrical fan out of the last stage is how much? So this is 1.93 equals LE stage uh, 4 times F of stage 4. LE is 1 because it's an inverter. So what's F for this particular stage? How much? Not really. What's the load capacitance? Load capacitance is 5, right? Fan out is 5, so we know 5. What's the input capacitance? Of this inverter. Remember, it has a size C. I don't know C yet, but you know that it has a size C. What does that mean in terms of capacitance? Input capacitance is going to be equal to C, right, by definition. So F is going to be 5 over C. So you multiply 1 times 5 over C, and that should be 1.93. So from this, you have only one variable left. You can basically find what the size of C should be. So C should be equal to 5 over 1.93. Clear? So in this case, I have determined that C is equals 5 over 1.93. And again, I can go cheat a little bit. It's 2.59. So 5 over 1.93 is something like 2 plus something. Okay. So that's the last stage. Now, now I know the capacitance here. I know what C is, so I know this load capacitance. It's 2.9 something, 2.95 I thought it was. So now I can basically go and size B. Because what we know, again, is that for this stage, the electrical fan out, F, EF of this stage, is equal to 1.93. It's going to be equal to LE times F of this stage. Now LE we know is 5 third. It's a two input no, uh, NOR gate, so it's two point. It's five third times what F is F? Well, F is ratio of the load capacitance versus the input capacitance. Load capacitance is how much? Yes, it's C equal to C, right? Input capacitance is what? Is B. We don't know B yet, but you can write it down. So the one point nine three is equal to five third times C over B. But we know C already. We can compute B. So we have determined this capacitance. And I can do the same thing now going to the first stage and compute A. And we're done. I have sized all my gates in such a way that my delay of my longest path or this path particular is minimized. I equally divided all the loads over all possible gates. So if you look at the numbers, just to get an idea here, you see that uh, now we have sized the kind, kind of structure quite bizarrely. You see, for instance, the inversion uh, inverter is sized larger than the complex gates. And that's again because of the fact that the inverter has an easier time driving capacitances. So they become larger. But uh, this is non-trivial anymore. For inverters you could kind of see it's all the same thing, they all have the same logical effort. Here logical effort will determine how the relative sizes of the gates in the pot is going to work out. Okay? Now, we can come back to the old question. Um, What's going to minimize the overall delay? Um, I already determined here, in this case, the number of stages is fixed. So what I'm trying to say is here, in this case, you're going to minimize delay by making delay over every particular gate equal. 
if I want to minimize the overall delay, the absolute minimum, I can also choose a number of stages. For instance, I should be perfectly legit for me to add two more inverters in the end. I, I could do that. If it helps me to get a better result. And remember, the, um, now that's not obvious in this particular case that you, because the load capacity is fairly small. You're not driving to drive a lot. So in this case, actually adding more gates won't help you very much. But you will imagine that the best, the optimal answer, the answer that gives you the best possible delay is when the effective fan out of every stage, EF, is equal to four. We come up with the same answer again. You try to, if you try to minimize the overall delay, what you try to do is make sure that every stage does the same amount of work. And then you basically figure out what is going to be, if, if I can choose the number of gates, what's going to be my optimal answer, while well, EF is going to be equal to this factor E, or the same equation that we had before. There's nothing different there, as shown right here. So the same equation, the delay is n times PE to the power of 1n plus this intrinsic delay. If you now say, well, I have the freedom to choose how many stages I have, I compute n, you're going to come up with exactly the same expression again. It's going to be uh, 3.6 is gamma is equal to 1, it's more close to 4 is basically the answer we're going to use. If gamma equal to zero, it's still effective fan out per stage should be equal in that e is equal to E or 2.7818. Same answer. No difference. It's the same equation. But now instead of minimizing the electrical fan out, it's the effective fan out of every stage that should be four. Okay? That's the only difference you have between the two. Okay? So let's do one more thing. Uh, I have one more complicating factor I want to add, and that's the branching factor. I haven't talked about that. So let's, oh, before I go there, let's go back to our old question. That was the question I was asking at the uh, beginning of the lecture. Which one would you choose? If you have all those structures here, you have an eight input AND gate. I can implement this as a two stage with some eight input AND and inversion. I can use four input gates or I can use two input gates. Which one is better? And I said, I don't know the answer, but no, at least I can think about this a little bit more reasonably. If you look at this, um, for this structure, it has two stages. One of them has a logical effort of one. Uh, we now know that the logical effort of an eight input NAND gate is going to be 10 over three. So the total logical effort along the path here is 10 over three. Um, again, we go to the next one has four input NAND gate, it turns out that the logical effort of four input NAND gate is two, and a two input NOR gate is five thirds. And then finally, we look at the last one, four thirds, five thirds, four thirds, four th and one. So let's now do a comparison. What I already can start looking at is, from a pure logical effort perspective, which one is gonna be better? And we see that the first one has 10 thirds, 10 thirds, and 80 over 27. Now, if I multiply this by nine, you see this is equal to 90 over 27. What it says is from a pure logical effort perspective, this one is gonna be the best. Kind of again, counterintuitive. But you have to be careful because there's another fact at place. You cannot ignore the fact that there's also a intrinsic delay connected to this. The intrinsic delay of an eight input NAND gate is eight, right? We say that the intrinsic delay, the P factor, is approximately equal to the fan in. So eight plus one is nine. That's the delay you have without driving any load capacitance. This one has six, and this one is seven. Okay? So which one is best? Really depends. If I have a very small load capacitance, if this is tiny, then this factor will dominate and actually the second structure will be the better one. If the load capacity is very large, logical effort will become more and more important. And this one has by far the smallest lower logical effort. Actually using two input gates is gonna be the best possible solution. And that's something you always see. If you really care about speed and you have a fairly large load capacity out there, you're gonna use very small gates. Instead of using gates with four inputs, eight inputs, six inputs, you're gonna use a chain of small gates and that's gonna give you the fastest answer. Again, non-intuitive, uh, but 
by just thinking about logical effort, I already can start reasoning about this. Something was very hard to do before we started the lecture today. OK, so as I said, I still have to talk about branching factor, but I'm going to postpone that to the beginning of next lecture. It's not going to change that much. It's just that we're going to change our equations a little bit. We now have to look at the total path effort. The total path effort between input and output is not only going to be, right now we say it's electrical fan out, input versus output capacitance, logical effort on the path, but we also have to take into account the branching effort, the amount of extra capacitance we have to drive. So we multiply, the path effort is now going to be the product of the total branching effort, total logical effort, electrical fan out of the path. And we're going to, again, divide this equally over all stages, same as we did before. OK? Good. So this is important. Um, a, as I said, this part is still going to be part of the midterm. And you may expect somewhere a logical effort question on the midterm. I can kind of guarantee you that. Uh, I know already. So, so be, make, make sure that you do some exercise on this, because it takes a little bit to kind of work yourself through it. But overall, as I said, now you have all the tools in your hand to really think about optimization of fairly complex logic networks. Okay? I have office hours right now, uh, so normal week schedule and things like that. All right, see you on Friday.